Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome the Right Honourable John Redwood, MP, to our meeting. Can I congratulate him, first of all, on his appointment as Chief Global Strategist at Charles Stanley in the City of London? I would rather that he was gainfully employed in Great George Street, but uh, it's welcome that his valuable talents have been put to good economic use. John's consistent and eloquent critique of the European Union over many years played a major part in the decision of the British people to vote Leave. John's journey began when he sat down and read the Treaty of Rome in 1975 and decided to vote against us joining the common market. And his journeys continued for another 40 years. Last week, he tabled an urgent question concerning the implications for our fishing industry of the transitional agreement between the government and the European Union. He told the House of Commons, this deal is unacceptable. Yeah. And he added, will the, will the government please just Get on with it. <laughs> the Treasury bench conceded that our government had accepted a suboptimal outcome. <laughs> Remember that phrase the next time your spouse or your colleagues express any concern that you may have let them down. Just respond by saying that you have achieved a suboptimal outcome. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John Redwood is consistent and persistent. It's not the first time he has raised the matter of Britain's fishing interests in the House of Commons. In 1988, he challenged the Iron Lady to change the law to ensure that control of our fishing fleets remained in British hands. She did but only for the courts eventually to strike down our very own legislation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John Redwood has never just been a critic. He has always been an advocate of positive alternative solutions. I commend his recent speech at Speaker's House, setting out his detailed agenda for post-Brexit Britain. It may, you may still be able to find it on the Parliament channel on your iPlayer. I highly recommend it. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome one of the greatest Conservative <coughs> thinkers and advocates of our time. Yes. John Redwood, <laughs> Member of Parliament. Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here amongst friends and fellow Brexit enthusiasts. And I want our government, committed as it tells me it is to Brexit, to be bolder and stronger about all the advantages that are going to come to our country as soon as we are free of the legal entanglement and the financial commitment of our membership of the European Union. Now I read in the press that people like me and perhaps people like you didn't understand what we were voting for. <laughs> I've got great news for my critics. I fully understood what I was voting for. I was voting to take back control. I was voting to leave the European Union. And that means leaving. It means saying goodbye to all their legal controls, their financial obligations, their vexatious laws, and their meddling with our policies. It means that we think 
We can be a self-governing democracy that can make good decisions for ourselves. Yeah. And when we make the mistake of... And when we make the mistake of electing bad governments that make silly decisions, we can have the pleasure of kicking them out and getting another lot. The problem with bad policy and bad decisions, which spewed forth from Brussels much of the time I was watching it, was you couldn't change the policy and you couldn't change the people who were responsible for doing it. You often couldn't work out who they were, and if you could work out who they were, uh, they were functionaries with well-paid jobs and they could not be discharged because they no longer please you and the other voters. I also read uh, that people like me, of course, uh, only voted the way we did uh, because we are very clever and we obviously didn't have a good education. <laughs> now, I, I fully confess, ladies and gentlemen, in the years I went to Oxford, I think they could have taught, perhaps taught me better. I think maybe I could have made better use of the facilities that were there. I, I confess my education could have been better, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> But the great news in a democracy is you don't have to pass an exam to get a vote. And sometimes looking at the situation in Britain, I think quite often it's the people who haven't passed exams who have the common sense and the vision to believe in our country and to believe in our democracy. Now, I take comfort from a couple of things in our current situation, you'll be relieved to hear. Uh, I take comfort from the fact that the government assures me that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And I take even more assurance from the fact that the European Union tells me that, because uh, it seems to matter quite a lot what the European Union thinks about all this. And so we have both sides in this uh, so-called negotiation actually agreeing this very fundamental proposition that we are not yet on the hook for any of these things that have been offered uh, by way of potential exit agreement. And that is very important because a lot of us don't think we owe the EU any money as, as we leave the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> and a lot of us think that we can do better if we make our own decisions on things like fishing and farming and borders and that the sooner we're able to do that, the better. But I take comfort from that rubric because, to me, it means uh, that in the end, we, the people, and our parliament, is going to have to make a judgment about any deal that they may have reached as to whether it is good enough for us or whether we should leave with no deal. Because the second thing I take comfort from uh, is that I and other parliamentarians of like mind have persisted throughout these long 18 months since the people's decision, pressing the government to assure us that they are doing everything necessary to prepare for exit with no deal should the need arise. <laughs> Whenever I put this point to the Prime Minister or her senior ministers, I'm told that of course they very keen to have a deal and they're very enthusiastic about a deal, I accept all that, but they always confirm this fundamental point that they are spending the money, they are making the decisions, they are carrying out the executive actions they need to do to make sure that everything will work in March 2019. And they know that I think no deal is a very attractive proposition in its own right. <laughs> get on with my colleagues, so I also concede that it is possible that they can come up with a deal which is even better than no deal, and I wish them, I wish them every success in doing that. But they need to realise how high a hurdle no deal is. What does no deal do? It means we don't pay them any extra money after the 29th of March 2019. That would be great, just think what we could do with all that money. It means that after March 2019 we can sign our own trade deals with all those other countries that would be quite keen to sign trade deals with us. It means that after March 2019 we can have our own sensible migration policy and control our own borders in the way we choose to do. It means that after March 2019 we take full control of our fishery and I think can come up with a policy which is 
kinder to our fish as well as better for our fishermen. It means we take back control of our farming policy. It means we no longer are under the European Court of Justice. It means we make our own laws and make our own decisions. That looks to me to be a pretty good package, ladies and gentlemen. And it was what I voted for. And I suspect from your enthusiastic applause, it was what quite a lot of you voted for. So we need to send this very clear message that over half the country not only knew what it was voting for, but it accepted that we might not get a deal and we still want to leave because there are so many wins out of no deal. Now, I wish them every success. I actually do think, as long as we are reasonably firm from here in the negotiation, that they will offer a, a tariff-free deal. Why wouldn't they? Because we're the customer mainly and, and they're the producer. <laughs> and so it is massively in their interests to do so. But a lot of my friends who are of the Remain faith tell me that the EU likes self-harm and it therefore <laughs> won't want to offer this tariff-free deal, and maybe they know them better than I do. We, we will find out in due course, but I hope they, they do offer us a tariff-free deal. Uh, I would be surprised if they didn't. I think they are more likely to if the government makes very clear to them that we are quite capable of just leaving with no deal, because that's the point at which then the German car makers and the French cheese makers and all the rest of them will be saying to their governments and to the EU Commission, are you sure we would actually like to have that tariff-free access to this very important market uh, that we know is out there? So I, I look forward to the next set of the negotiations when we, we are at last, at last allowed to talk about the things that are more interest and possible benefit to the United Kingdom, because the negotiations so far have been all about the things that the EU wants, and the Prime Minister has been extremely generous and wanted to uh, keep uh, friendly relations to try and see if we can get a good deal. I understand what she's trying to do, but I think we're now at the point where the UK government has to say to the EU, we've given you a knockout offer on all the things that matter to you. These are all the things we would now want for that future trading arrangement and that future partnership. And if they're not forthcoming, then we have to start withdrawing the suggested draft offers that have been made up to this point. And I think that's the more likely way to end up with a deal than if we looked as if we might give a bit more ground. The danger is you give too much ground, and then the British public and some of the British Parliament turn around and say, that is not what Brexit was all about. This isn't the freedom to do what we wish and the freedom to spend our own money. I'm also urging the government uh, not only to get on with the negotiations, which I think they now wish to do, but to get on with setting out to the country all those new policies that we can put in as soon as we are free to do so. I would like that to be uh, April 2019, but if it has to be January 2021, then I understand that. I think it's still right to get on with it now, and it, it's a very exciting prospect. Let's begin with fishing. The EU fishing policy has been disastrous for the UK fishing ground and for the UK industry. Uh, when we first joined the, the European Union, we were a substantial net exporter of fish, and we had one of the most productive fishing grounds in the world, uh, alongside the Norwegian one, which we share in the North Sea. And then 45 years on, we are a heavy net importer of fish, uh, our fishing grounds have been considerably damaged by overfishing, and one of the big reasons uh, why it's all gone so wrong uh, is that the fishing control system required fishermen and fisherwomen to throw back dead fish into the sea that didn't meet the quota requirements. And if you move to a fishing policy where you land everything they catch and then argue about how much more they can catch thereafter, it means that you don't kill so many fish but you eat more fish, and that seems to me to be a good deal for the fish eater and not a bad deal for the fish because they've got better, better chances of surviving because uh, you will be killing fewer fish, but you'll be putting more fish on your plate. And I would also like more of that activity to be done uh, in British registered vessels, and I'd like all that fish to be landed in the UK so that we have a chance to add the value and to police the, the fishing grounds properly. So the sooner we are what is called an independent coastal state, 
uh, taking control of our own waters, the better. The next thing I'm very keen to do is to uh, get the hands on the money. Uh, there was a lot of argument about the money in, in the referendum. Uh, our opponents can't say we didn't understand the money. Uh, I think everybody in the country got the idea that there'd be quite a bit of money to spend once we were out. There was a bit of a disagreement over exactly how much, uh, with uh, people getting involved in accounting arguments about gross and net figures and all the rest of it. But I think everybody uh, of any common sense agreed it's a lot of money and it would be really handy to spend that right now on public services and tax cuts in our country. Yeah. Uh, and I, um, at the request of Vote Leave, did set out an indicative budget before the referendum. Uh, we made it very clear that I was very unlikely to be Chancellor of Exchequer and it was only advisory or illustrative. I got one of those predictions right. I also got the economic predictions right, unlike the other side, who uh, said that we would immediately plunge into deep recession and it would be uh, very difficult economically. And so I, I set out in there what we would do. I, I made social care and health uh, big priorities on the spending side. And I also decided to highlight a few tax cuts I would like. And the ones I chose uh, were done because I think they're very worthy tax cuts in their own right, but there was a little bit of politics in it because so I decided to choose uh, VAT impositions, uh, which we're not allowed to remove for ourselves all the time we are in the European Union. Uh, so I cho chose quite difficult ones for my opponents. I chose the female hygiene products. Why not cancel the VAT on that? I chose all those green controls and uh, insulation systems, much beloved of the so-called liberal left, uh, and said we'd like to take the VAT off those completely, but you're not allowed to in your beloved EU. Uh, and then I said, I and my colleagues are very worried about people on low incomes uh, not being able to heat their homes properly in the winter and so forth, so let's take that off domestic fuel. Yeah. Uh, again, we're not allowed to do that under EU rules. So I think if the Chancellor of Exchequer would at some point pick up a package like that, or maybe he's got a more imaginative and better package than I, he may well have, I have no idea, but I wish he wouldn't keep it secret from me and the British public, ladies and gentlemen. I'm desperate to hear how they're going to spend the money, whether they're going to give it back to us as tax cuts or whether they're going to give it to public services. I suggest they do a bit of both and it would relieve a lot of those pressures and deal with a lot of those arguments they're having. We wouldn't need this very big debate about where the extra money for health comes from if we use the substantial sum of money we're going to be saving uh, by getting out of the EU. It's also very good news economically because, of course, our biggest deficit problem is not the state deficit, that's now under pretty good control and years of hard work have seen that down. It's the balance payments deficit and that is almost entirely uh, in trade, a balance payments deficit in goods with the EU. We, we actually have a surplus with the rest of the world so it shows that you don't need to be in the EU to trade successfully with people. We trade very successfully with those who are not in the EU, we have a problem with trading with those in the EU. But the other reason our balance payments is weak is that, of course, all that £12 billion pounds a year net that we send to the European Union is a negative on the balance payments. It, it's like importing a load of things, only you don't get the advantage of the things. You, you just have to give the money away overseas. So wouldn't it be good if we didn't have to give all that money away and there would be that immediate improvement in our balance payments? It's this kind of straightforward economics that you don't normally read in the Treasury documents. Uh, and you, you don't seem to hear too much from all those Remain forecasters who tell me they're much more expert than I am and uh, who, who am I to dare to offer a forecast. That was the question I got throughout the referendum campaign when they did let me loose on the television and radio, which was probably a good idea, it wasn't too often, uh, but they, um, they constantly said when I asserted that the economy would be fine once we left, assuming we pursued sensible domestic policies, and they've confronted me with the World Bank and the IMF and the Treasury and the Pope and the President and all the rest of it and told me that they all were backed by this mighty empire of talent and forecasting and that it was going to be a winter recession immediately after we left and then long-term turmoil and trouble with a, a lower growth rate and I explained why that wasn't true and I'm still waiting for the apology, ladies and gentlemen. We, we now know that the 12 to 18 month forecast, very big treasury document, which was made much of by the then Charles the Exchequer, uh, was wrong on practically every count. House prices down, now they went up a little bit. 
Uh, jobs down? No, they went up quite a lot. Unemployment up? No, it went down. Uh, general economic growth will go negative in recession? No, it accelerated a little after we the vote and then slowed a little bit the following year, but carried on more or less at the same rate. So comprehensively wrong. They said, ah, oh, yes, but we did say the pound would go down. Well, it had been going down for 18 months before the vote, nothing to do with the vote. Uh, it's quite true, it, it had a quick, sharp fall immediately after the vote. It then had another fall when the Bank of England, three months later, decided to cut interest rates for no apparently good reason, uh, other than to say, oh, we're very worried about Brexit, and maybe the pound should go down a bit more. Uh, but the great news is that the pound against the dollar is today around the level it was at just before the vote. So even that forecast is now looking a bit dodgy. Um, they have a better case on, on pound against the euro, but the euro has been strong against all currencies around the world, so I think it's more to do with the euro than it is to do with the pound. The other thing that I think we need to crack on with is to have a fair and sensible borders policy. And I remember the Vote Leave campaign was very strong on this. We said we wanted a policy which was fair across the world. We didn't want to discriminate in favor of people from Europe as opposed to the rest of the world. Uh, and we weren't seeking to stop all inward migration. We, we wish to be open to tourists, to talent, to students who want to come to our decent universities, to investors, to people who can pay their own way. The only thing we wanted to do was to control the numbers of people coming in to claim benefits and the numbers of people coming in to take low paid jobs, which we hoped uh, could be made available to people already here. And we want to get the wages up a bit as well uh, to make it more attractive. So that was the, the very sensible proposition we put forward. That, as I understand it, is where the government may well end up, but I would like them to get on with it. I think it would give people confidence and courage if we now had the white paper setting out what it would look like, doesn't require strong new physical borders, there's no great Irish border problem in the way uh, the media constantly tell me, because the way you would most obviously do it is if you want to take a job here, you need a work permit, and that all has to be sorted out in advance of you coming, so you don't have people queuing at the border, and if you want to claim benefits, the answer is you have to live here for a certain number of years before you can. So, so don't come here with no money and claim benefits. You would have to qualify as a refugee or an asylum seeker or whatever in order to be able to do that. Different category, uh, clear, fair rules across the world, not just geared to Europe. So I think that would give people confidence and courage uh, if we started to set that kind of thing up. So, ladies and gentlemen, I really do want to get on with it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day when I can talk to an audience like you about something other than Brexit. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to when I can talk to you about how we can use all that, those powers, that saved money, that opportunity, which teams for an independent democratic country once it has severed the legal links and entrapments of the European Union. In my lecture in Speaker's House, I did a little bit of history, and I pointed out to my opponents that having reviewed our economic progress uh, since 1970, it was very noticeable that when we went into the European economic community, we didn't suddenly have a growth spurt, we actually had a recession. It wasn't much to do with the EEC, but it, there was no growth spurt, and we didn't get a growth spurt after the recession was ended. And then when they completed their so-called single market in 1992, we had another recession, and that one was directly caused by the European Union itself because it was caused by the disaster of the European exchange rate mechanism. And again, there was no spurt in growth uh, after the recovery phase got underway. So I argue that if you didn't get a big bonus out of joining the thing, how are you going to lose so much when you actually leave the thing? <laughs> Indeed, it is clearer than that, that if you take the fishing industry or the farming industry or the motor vehicle industry, they were very badly damaged by European Yay. Union policies, uh, in some cases in the early years, and in some cases throughout our period in the European Union, and freed of that constraint, we can have policies that promote more jobs and more prosperity. So ladies and gentlemen, my message to the government is nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. No deal is the hurdle to get above if you can. 
Otherwise, you will find many willing people in Britain just want to leave in March 2019 and not cling on to some ersatz European Union and try and rejoin the club by the back door. That is not what we voted for. So get on with it. No deal is better than a bad deal. And I wish them success in getting a good deal, but I'd be mightily relieved if I knew we were out in April 2019. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, John, and thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, for that reception you've just given to our speaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Liam Halligan. I first saw Liam speak uh, about three or four months ago in the City of London, and I realised he was a very robust speaker. He was addressing a meeting, almost, I would say, 90, 95% Remainers. Vicky Price was there. I don't know if you remember Vicky. Yeah. The former wife of Chris Hume, uh, the leader of that great Liberal Democratic Party. And uh, the meeting was full of people that held very similar views to Vicky Price. But uh, Liam had the answers and he dealt with the audience very robustly and got his case over. Uh, I think he'll probably have a slightly easier ride this evening. <laughs> He's probably best known uh, for his award-winning economic agenda column in the Sunday Telegraph. But he's much more than an award-winning journalist. Between 2007 and 2013, he was chief economist at Prosperity Capital Management, an institution controlling $4 billion of investments. He's also served as head of research at the Social Market Foundation, and has worked closely with David Owen and Lord Skellig Dalsey. He has written and presented numerous television documentaries, including NHS, Where Did All the Money Go? And a Public Service, Private Profit, Investigating PFI. And he's also written persuasively concerning our chronic housing shortage. With Gerald Lyons, <coughs> who spoke at our party conference meeting, Liam co-authored Clean Brexit, which sets out a clear and concise vision of how Britain and the world can make a great success of Brexit. As we all know, considerable stammer is needed to be a successful participant in the Leave movement. And Liam demonstrated that capability when he rode for the ISIS crew in 1994. <laughs> Lastly, it should be noted that Liam is also a citizen of the Republic of Ireland. So he's probably uniquely qualified to answer the Salwick Holstein question of the 21st century <laughs> <laughs> as to how the government can leave the European Union and abide by the commitments that it is given concerning the Irish border. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Liam Halligan. Thank you very much. So I'm an economist. Uh, that means I'm the kind of expert who doesn't know what he's talking about. But I'm going to make you feel, ladies and gentlemen, as if that's your fault. Thank you, for that. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to follow uh, John Redwood. There aren't many soaring intellects in British uh, public life, actually, certainly not in the House of Commons. Uh, John Redwood, fellow of All Souls, um, formerly of St Anthony's College, Oxford as well, where I was proud to, to study, uh, is certainly uh, one of them, and it's a pleasure to follow him. It's also a pleasure to be here Generally, when I get up on my hind legs and talk about Brexit, I'm hissed at, uh, I'm booed, I'm what's called subtweeted by passive-aggressive reporters from papers that aren't white, um, and that's only in the kitchen. Um, but seriously, it's very nice to be here. 
Um, I think it's the duty of somebody with the privilege of writing a column in a place like the Sunday Telegraph and elsewhere where I write columns to roll your sleeves up, get involved, take part in public debates, put your views on the line uh, and face the consequences and that's what I try to do uh, in my life. So first ladies and gentlemen, they said we were too thick to know what we were voting for. <laughs> then they said we were racist. On top of that, they said that those of, those of us who voted to leave the European Union were too old. Anything to discredit the biggest act of democracy in British history. Now they have a new excuse, don't they? The Brexit vote had nothing to do with the overbearing EU, the reams of regulation, the anti-democratic diktats, the hundreds of billions of pounds that we've sent to Brussels since 1973. It had nothing to do with the desire of a seemingly independent nation to re-empower its democratically elected lawmakers by taking back control in that great phrase of our laws, our borders and our money. Nothing at all. Now we're told, endlessly, our airwaves full of the message, morning, noon and night over the last week, now we're told that those of us who voted for Brexit were manipulated by online propaganda, <laughs> funded by cheating and overspending. Now the timings of these revelations, of this path-breaking journalism, they have nothing to do with the fact that the EU withdrawal bill is at a crucial stage in the House of Lords. Total coincidence. It's completely unrelated to the fact that the government, despite the European Commission's efforts, has lately had actually some decent progress to report on our Article 50 negotiations, with agreements on citizens' rights and increasing signs of bilateral deals on the horizon with non-EU nations once we leave. It was all the fault of social media. That's what swung the referendum in Leave's favour, even though those older voters, it was your fault, are really on social media anyway. <laughs> and it was the Leave side spending more than Remain. Even though the Electoral Commission's own figures show that Remain spent 16.1 million and Leave spent 13.4. Remain channeled 1.1 million of that to so-called satellite campaigning organisations, legally within the rules, organisations such as Best for Our Future and the In Crowd, all of them set up in the last few weeks before June the 23rd, 2016, as the establishment panicked and realised that for all their efforts, the British people, in their wisdom and courage, were capable of making up their own mind and rationally, independently voting to quit the European Union. Yes, the Leave side also paid money to satellite campaign groups, again, entirely within the rules, an amount of 670,000, compared to 1.1 million, less than two-thirds of the total spent by those opposing Brexit. So, Remain spent 20% more than Leave overall, 16.1 million compared to 13.4 million. And it spent a lot more on those satellites that are now being presented as shadowy. And then we must remember that the Cameron Os and Osborne government, in addition to those numbers I just gave you, spent 9 million more producing, posting, and then digitally promoting the leaflet, the neutral leaflet. <laughs> Honestly, titled, neutrally, Why the Government Believes Voting to Remain in the EU is the Best Decision for the UK. <laughs> if you study that leaflet, as Jared Lyons and I did in Clean Brexit in detail, it presents an extremely one-sided and in some places completely misleading case for Remain. And that leaflet, with cynical timing, unbelievably cynical timing, was sent just days before the government's pre-referendum purla period kicked in. As such, the cost of producing and distributing a wholly pro-remain mail shot with the coat of arms of the British government at the top was met from general taxation, ladies and gentlemen. Not counting as part of the specific and equal state funding that was earmarked for both sides. As such, leave was not only heavily outspent during the referendum, random campaign, ladies and gentlemen, it began with a nine million pound disadvantage. Yes. Yes. And that's even before one considers that 
the entire machinery of government, of course, all those treasury dodgy dossiers with their immediate and profound economic shocks, and the 800,000 job losses following a Brexit vote. Fact, said George Osborne on Newsnight. Fact, said George Osborne on the six o'clock news. And then on the Today programme the next day, and then the day after that as well. It doesn't include the fact that the Foreign Office, of course, urged the then President of the United States to warn the entire country when it come, came to trading with the country that's already our biggest single country, country trading partner, that we will be at, at the back of the queue post-Brexit. Then, of course, there was the CBI, TUC, and all the other self-serving, useless acronyms wedded to the status quo. <laughs> their, e their every utterance reported breathlessly across the bulletins, on a loop as hard-hitting, path-breaking news. So let us consider a year from Brexit Day, ladies and gentlemen, that despite all those warnings, despite all that effort by the establishment, 17.4 million British people still voted for Brexit. They knew what they were voting for, and their votes are every bit as important as all those who voted remain. In a fair contest, showing immense wisdom, the British public voted leave, which speaks volumes about this country's remaining capacity, no pun intended, for independent thought and critical thinking. So away with your bitter nonsense, Ramonas. Grow up and accept the results of this democratic referendum. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, acknowledge that. Let's acknowledge that the campaign to reverse Brexit is in full swing. Let us acknowledge that the UK's negotiations are now subject to full-scale wrecking tactics and there's no doubt more to come. Political and corporate interests determined to upend the 2016 referendum are seeking to renege on the outcome of the Brexit vote. Jeremy Corbyn clearly wants to leave the European Union. He opposed membership of the European Economic Community in the 1975 referendum and as an MP he voted against Maastricht and then the Lisbon Treaty in 2009. Yet the Labour leader now, despite his much vaunted principles, says he wants to stay in a customs union with the EU, contradicting his own party's manifesto of June 2017. For Corbyn, all that matters is causing chaos and toppling the government. Whatever the cost of this country, that's about the only thing on which momentum and the party's Blairite rump can now agree. What do they care that the customs union puts a tariff wall around the entire EU, imposing charges on exports from the rest of the world? That means, of course, that UK shoppers pay more, particularly on food, clothing and footwear, goods accounting for a high share of our poorer households' incomes, and often to protect inefficient EU producers elsewhere. Some 80% of those tariff revenues are then sent automatically and directly to Brussels, a fact I am yet to hear mentioned on a mainstream news bulletin in this country. And because, because the UK has a higher share of non-EU trade than other large EU members, we get a uniquely bad deal from being inside this protectionist customs union. Yes, the customs union means there are no tariff barriers within the EU, which we're often told is vital to protect complex supply chains. But such tariffs generally only apply to finished goods, ladies and gentlemen, not components. And outside the customs union, frictionless trade is still possible under a UK-EU free trade agreement, if and when we get one. Customs union membership apparently means we benefit from the EU's 60-plus free trade agreements with other nations, or 76 if you're operating Alistair Campbell's Twitter account. <laughs> How often is the public told how often are we told that only 30 of these agreements are actually ratified and in force? <laughs> Some are with sizable countries, yes, like South Korea and Mexico, both economies that said they now want bilateral bespoke deals with the UK. But most of the EU's trade deals are actually with minnows and microstates. All the EU's trade deals added up cover 8% of the global economy. The EU is very bad at negotiating trade deals because member states' interests so often conflict. That's why after years of trying, there's no EU free trade agreement with the US, China, India, or any really large economy, ladies and gentlemen. 
The UK has a much better chance of securing deals with those big economies negotiating alone. We're a sizable economy. Even Switzerland, which is 18th in the world compared to our fifth in terms of size, signed a free trade agreement with China in 2014 after 14 months of negotiation. This is doable. And deals cut by London will favour sectors where Britain is strong, such as services, rather than being skewed towards French and German interests as EU free trade agreements so often are. Now, when the UK joined the EEC in the early 1970s, the bloc accounted for 30% of global GDP. Once we've left, it'll be just 15% of global GDP, despite the EU now comprising more than four times more member states. The direction of travel is clear. It makes no sense for a diverse, competitive economy like ours to be behind a tariff wall that harms our consumers and discriminates against the 85% of the world economy that's outside the EU. Mr. Corbyn, you should remember that. Well, leave, and at the same time, that will leave us unable to cut those bespoke trade agreements that we need with the world's largest markets, where the growth is, where we need to be trading more and more to secure the prosperity of our children and our grandchildren. The CBI recently claimed its case to stay in the EU in the customs union was about facts and not ideology. They claim that you can stay in the customs union, quote, while respecting to the vote to leave the EU. That's absolute abject nonsense. The EU began life as a customs union. It's what it is. The mechanism enshrined in the 1957 Treaty of Rome. And it's an honor to be in the room with pretty much the only person who's read it. <laughs> Customs Union membership embodies the essence of EU membership. We must remember organizations like the CBI exist to protect the large, the interests of the large corporate uh, uh, incumbents, uh, which is that want the status quo. They never want any change. Leaving the customs union, they would help those dynamic smaller firms with bespoke EU trade, UK trade agreements, helping them export to a much broader range of markets. So, Mr. Corbyn, you're aligning yourself with big corporate interests at the expense of British shoppers and genuine British entrepreneurs. You're backing a customs union that blocks both low value and high value exports from some of the poorest countries on earth. How progressive is that? Mindful of the billions of pounds of tariff revenue we send to Brussels each year, of course, the European Commission is determined to keep Britain inside its ghastly customs union. But the UK would then be obliged to impose EU tariffs uh, uh, without being able to influence them. Despite opting for Brexit, the British government wouldn't have control of our money laws and trade as voters were told, if we stay inside this customs union. And of course, Corbyn's recent vault fast on the customs union was timed to coincide with the throwing of what one Brussels insider glibly dubbed, with apparently no understanding of history, quotes, a hand grenade aimed at the British Parliament. <laughs> Talking about the Irish border, a hand grenade <laughs> aimed at the British government. The EU tried deliberately to destabilise the UK by issuing a draft treaty rendering operational plans to create a border in the Irish Sea, effectively splitting Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. This incendiary outcome, this incendiary outcome can only be avoided, Brussels tell us, its words repeated as gospel by UK broadcasters if Britain stays in the EU's customs union. The Prime Minister made her opposition very quickly Crystal clear quotes. David Davis threatened to withhold UK cash unless the EU backs down over Northern Ireland's border. They were right to do so. For this Irish border issue, and it is a subject close to my heart, this Irish border issue is being cynically and irresponsibly hijacked by both the Commission and its ultra-remain acolytes here in the UK in an attempt to frighten the British public and make Brexit seem impossible and irresponsible. The very light border between the North and the Irish public already copes, the existing border already copes with different currencies, excise duties and other tax rates. The UK government has established, as detailed in an August 2017 paper, that post-Brexit there's no need for the kind of physical border checks that could inflame sectarian 
sensitivities. The head of HMRC himself has made clear no border is necessary, as has his Irish equivalent. Even a European Commission paper published in November 2017 accepted there was no need for physical border posts. Technology and cameras would be sufficient. Cameras which actually, if you know that part of the world, you will know, already exist on approaches to the Irish border. <laughs> Despite all that, the European Commission continues flatly to reject any common sense solution. So keen is it to mess, to mess with the, Northern, the precious Northern Ireland peace process, to put pressure on May. Because when it comes to the Irish border, ladies and gentlemen, Brussels isn't looking for a solution. No. Brussels is looking for a weapon. No. No. What kind of an organisation deliberately frustrates a government seeking to implement the democratic will of its people? What kind of people seek to aggravate ancient cross-border enmities so greatly improved in recent years but still so fragile just because a nation wants to leave the European Union? Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about No Deal. Jerry and I talk, talked a lot about No Deal in our policy exchange paper of December 2016, which came out before Lancaster House. And in Clean Brexit, our book, which was published in uh, September 2017, we developed a lot of these arguments. Now, it's my view, well, like John Redwood, I would absolutely want a free trade agreement between the European Union and the UK as quickly as we possibly can. I am forced to conclude, given where we are now, given all the foot dragging over uh, money and sequencing uh, and Northern Ireland by the Commission, I'm forced to conclude that the most likely outcome of our Article 50 negotiations now, in my view, is that we leave in March 2019 with no deal. That's the most likely outcome. <laughs> Not least given the Commission's overwhelming interest in discouraging others from leaving, so retaining its vast, chronically mismanaged budget. I don't want there to be no deal, but that is the most likely outcome. That's why my book with Jerry says Britain needs to prepare both politically, practically and psychologically to trade with the EU under WTO rules. Happily, ladies and gentlemen, that is, quotes, perfectly manageable, despite what you often read and hear on the airwaves. Now, who said that? Not me, not John Redwood. Perfectly manageable, the UK trading with the EU under WTO rules, was the exact phrase used, and I have the recording, by Roberto Azevedo, who is the Director General of the WTO, the world's most senior trade diplomat, who I went to Geneva to interview late last year. Perfectly manageable. An EU free trade agreement is clearly preferable. But even though it's preferable, Relatively low WTO tariffs, which the EU will probably impose on us, and we can choose whether or not to impose on them, we don't have to, won't stop cross-channel trade. Remember Anna Subri said, trade outside the EU would fall absolutely almost to zero? <laughs> <laughs> the standard bearer. <laughs> no, I must be rude, even though she's rude about me. <laughs> And if Britain does impose tariffs on EU imports under WTO rules, and that's our choice, that's our choice, guess what? The Treasury will be several billion pounds better off! <laughs> Trading with no free trade agreement will disrupt some industries at the outset, I fully accept that. But these net tariff revenues, four, five, six billion pounds, depending on the calculations that you do and the assumptions that you make, these net tariff revenues could be used to ease these sector difficulties, should the government so choose. Britain already trades under WTO rules. We mustn't be scared with the US, our biggest single country trading partner. <coughs> the majority of our trade, in fact, is outside the EU, largely under WTO rules. Such non-EU trade, as John said, is fast growing and generates a surplus, adding to the UK's national wealth. Our EU trading contrast is shrinking and records an annual deficit, subtracting from our prosperity. 
and if single market and customs union membership for working for Britain, ladies and gentlemen, that quite simply wouldn't be the case. Now clearly, post-Brexit Britain must and will continue trade to trade extensively with the EU. I hope we do sign what the Prime Minister called a bold and ambitious free trade agreement with the EU. But despite our best efforts, I can't see such a deal being agreed, let alone ratified by 27 EU nations and the European Parliament, yeah, Guy Verhofstadt's keen, <laughs> before next March. And that may actually be no bad thing. What's most important is securing a trade deal that's good for Britain in the long term. If we cut a bad trade deal in a panic with the European Union, we're stuck with it for a generation. Negotiating against a hard deadline, be it March 2019 or December 2020, the end of the implementation period, allows the EU to impose far tougher terms. Doing a trade deal once the Brexit dust has settled may make more sense, but only as long as we're prepared for that WTO fallback position. Once the vis visceral politics of these Brexit talks are over, the UK's left and the world hasn't stopped turning. <laughs> Those continental commercial lobbies that also want a good EU-UK free trade agreement, the German car makers, the French food producers and so on, they should be able to better sideline the ghastly commission and via their national governments and their voters get their voices heard. We must recognise, ladies and gentlemen, no deal as an entirely satisfactory outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, 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 we need to spend money visibly visibly on preparing for no deal, yeah. customs, facilities and so on, making preparations that in many cases we need to make anyway. The government must actively reassure the public and warn Brussels that steps are being taken to ensure smooth customs and border arrangements after 29th of March next year, whatever the outcome of these talks. That means spending money and it was a major missed opportunity, I'm afraid, that such words weren't heard in the Chancellor's spring statement when the world was watching. The new CDS customs IT systems is anyway thankfully well advanced. It will need to be adapted for conditions outside the customs union. We need to tell the world that that is happening. We, physical infrastructure will need to be constructed at our ports and airports. Customs and border forces will need to be recruited and trained. Yeah. Money has been set aside, we're told. We need to see visibly that it's being spent yeah. to prepare for no deal. And Anything else is to completely undermine our own negotiating position. Now, no one is advocating a failure to settle administrative issues with the EU under no deal, such as mutual recognition agreements on goods, aircraft, landing rights, and all the rest of it. Now, these existing and entirely uncontroversial protocols already extend to countless non-EU members from the EU and are often nothing to do with the EU anyway, so they can be solved. No deal doesn't mean chaos. No deal simply means we trade with the EU under WTA rules, as we trade with the US, as most of the world trades with most of the world. That's the regime covering most of our existing trades, as I said, and most trade between all countries everywhere. It's not essential to strike an EU free trade agreement by March 2019 or by December 2020, but failing to grasp that is a major strategic error. So, in sum, in sum, Semantics are important. Language is important. <coughs> Leaving the single market and the customs union, ladies and gentlemen, isn't hard Brexit. It's Brexit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the benefits of the UK being inside both these legal arrangements are enormously overstated across much of the mainstream media and the drawbacks are systematically downplayed to the point of very rarely being mentioned, if at all. The government simply must stick to the Prime Minister's plans, as outlined in the Lancaster House speech, and then again in Florence and at the Mansion House. To stay in the single market, the customs union, or both, would leave the UK in an extremely weak position and be a betrayal of the Brexit referendum. And for my final point, I absolutely join with John here. It's high time that ministers, whichever way they voted in the referendum, make a concerted and sustained effort to highlight to the entire country, to the EU and to the world, the advantages of being outside the European Union. Far from being a cross to bear, Brexit is a huge opportunity for the UK. The tough process of leaving, ladies and gentlemen, 
made deliberately tougher by the European Commission, is temporary and will soon be over. The benefits of regaining our sovereignty and raising our sights beyond the EU to the world, they're permanent. Thank you. Thank you for that brilliant analysis. Uh, I think that's probably done everybody in this room a lot of good. <laughs> Can I please have the first question for our speakers? Yeah, I'll take a question from that gentleman on the gangway. Thank you. Uh, that's a message, for, uh, question for John about being positive alternatives for the um, transition. Uh, one option for a transition could be an EFTA EA uh, transition. Um, if you look at it this time next year, we'll be out of the ECJ, and the EFTA court, which is non-political. We could, we could negotiate free trade agreements, which would allow, from a sequencing point of view, financial services uh, free trade agreements, while we then, two years later, leave the EU. The Northern Ireland question is solved. Agriculture, fisheries, home affairs, justice is also solved. 70% of the uh, regulations decrease. Uh, it's the easiest and simplest and really difficult one to, uh, how can I say, disagree with. Um, the question is, would you be able to propose this to the government in terms of a better alternative to the current transition deal? We'll take John first and I'm sure Liam's got some. No. <laughs> want an independent country, we're better on our own, we know what we're doing. There is no Northern Ireland problem that's real. As, as Liam has said, it's an entirely put up political job of a very unpleasant kind. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. there are, is already a smuggling issue over the border. There's already the issue about how you have intelligence about criminals over the border. We deal with it. It works perfectly well. It's not going to become impossible once we've left the EU. So let's just get on with it. Yes. Liam? A lot of people who I respect have, have um, promoted this line using EFTA or EEA as a transition. Two are, uh, well one at least is David Owen, um, because he's concerned that the EU will really rat on us and not give us things like the mutual recognition agreements and be completely self-harming. And he, he comes at that, he says that not because he's a sort of closet remainer, he is absolutely not a closet remainer. He's, uh, um, He's as ardent about Brexit as anybody in this room, I, I'd suggest. Um, the, the, I don't accept that the EFTA court is non-political. It almost, well, it often mirrors the ECJ. Uh, and EFTA, and certainly the EEA, rather than waiting rooms to leave the European Union, or waiting rooms to get in. Um, and if you look at the Swiss situation, yes, the, you know, the Switzerland is quite literally surrounded by the EU, and, 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 and we're not. And even Switzerland, even though it's hiding lots of sort of people's dodgy money, um, even Switzerland has to. Sorry, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> your, your Honour, Your Honour, um, lots of Swiss friends. Um, uh, um, it still has, it still has a tremendous struggle with the European Union to maintain the independence of its borders. It's it's a constant um, um, uh, argument in Swiss politics with the EU constantly threatening to. Um, breach those the, the, treat, the succession of treaties that make up its sort of single market membership. It's not in the single market. It's, a, it's completely wrong to say it's in the single market. It has a number of trade treaties that add up to something quite short of single market membership. But the EU keeps threatening to renege on those unless it takes more people and, and at least pretends that it's got um, free, it's part of free movement. And as for Northern Ireland, I, I have to be, uh, I mean, I, I could to talk about this all night. All I would say is this. I agree very much with the John's analysis uh, and it's you know, typically a, of him um, astute and on the money. Um, but we have to be very, very sensitive about, about the way Irish people feel, particularly Irish people who, who live in and around the border. Even Irish people who, like a lot of my family, who are extremely well disposed to, to, to Britain. So much has changed in Ireland during my lifetime. For 
people like me of Irish origin growing up in the UK, plastic paddies as the Irish call us, I can't tell you how amazing it is that we now have a sort of good relationship with Britain. Because people like me were caught in between, and my dad who came over from County Mayo, we were just caught in between and no side trusted us, and it was absolutely awful. The fact that you know, my children can travel to Ireland and their Irish cousins you know, hug them and love them, and there's, there's not that same animosity, enormously important. Didn't the Queen do a great job going yeah. to the government? Yeah. Against the advice of most of her courtiers, by the way. And then Prince Charles had the courage to go to the west of Ireland, obviously a very painful place for him for reasons that I remember and many of people in this room will remember. And when I cycled up the Mall, the first time we had a state visit from uh, the Irish president in the UK the year after, um, it was a really emotional thing for me, seeing those Union Jacks and those, those green and orange and white tricklers. Uh, 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 very, very important. And so I'd say this, we have to be very, very careful about our rhetoric in this area. We have to acknowledge that while technically we're right, and we are right, and technically the EU is trying to take the Irish people for a ride, as a lot of the Irish public agree, the Ireland's a lot more Eurosceptic <laughs> if you actually read the Irish press going beyond the Irish post. It's lots, lots of sort of canny people knowing what's happening. But I'd say this, and I'd encourage John to try and um, put his shoulder to this mill. It is absolutely vital, and she's already missed the trick, it's one of the main mistakes she's made since coming to office. It is absolutely, absolutely vital, ladies and gentlemen, that Theresa May becomes the first ever leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party to address the Irish doll. Yeah. She never has, no Conservative leader ever has, as Prime Minister or leader of the opposition. Tony Blair, canny as he was, straight in there straight in there. It will be such a shame if during this very, very, not difficult, because I think it will work out well in the end, but certainly fragile period, the, the most fragile period pretty much since the Good Friday Agreement, the combination of uh, direct rule looming uh, in, in the north and also lots and lots of border scare stories being punted around by an overwhelmingly pro-EU Irish establishment and media. She has to go and reassure the Irish people that she isn't trying to lord it over them, quite literally. She needs to go to Dublin, she needs to walk about, she needs to talk to and meet people, and she needs to respect and address the Irish Parliament. Yes, lady just on the end of the row there. If you could just stand up, madam, and put your question. Thank you very much indeed. Um, two quick questions. One is, we, we've, I, I understand we've got ships now that are going to patrol on the seas and I understand we're getting our fishing uh, communities stronger and back. What I don't understand, nobody's explained to me in all my reading, is that who's going to buy this, the fishing quotas back from the Spanish government? Second question and quick, I'm absolutely astounded in today's times that I've read, it's going to take about five years to sort out a customs uh, security system for our borders. Five years. If that is true, good. <laughs> if it is, for God's sake, we are definitely being let down by this government. Please, please reassure me and all of us that they're on it now, they've got 500 civil servants that they've brought in to deal with all this, surely we can have our borders sorted in time. Thank you very much. John, well, I, I have great news for you. We, we do today have a perfectly functioning border system capable of levying customs dues according to WTO rules. Because they do and it. And it, they do it every day for the bulk of our trade, which is under WTO rules. So what we're talking about is if there is no deal, and we go to WTO rules, and if the EU then imposes the common tariff, uh, two hypotheticals, uh, then we just have to scale up that process. We know what it looks like. We invented all the forms, we've got the electronic paperwork, and you just have to use that electronic paperwork for your uh, export or import from France, just as you do for your import or export from the United States of America. So it is all humbug. I mean, I, when I ran a, a big industrial company a few years ago, 
Uh, I now realize I was running something called a complex supply chain. <laughs> and I realized that I should have fallen over on this complex supply chain because I had a complex supply chain, which meant that we brought some things in from within the EU, and we dared to bring some things in from outside the EU. And do you know there's something very surprising? We never had any problems bringing things in from outside the EU. <laughs> Indeed, I think it's probably a little bit more difficult bringing some of the things in from the EU sometimes because of strikes and whatnot on the continent. So I don't buy this idea that there's a cliff edge, a complex supply chain, or there's something that customs can't handle, and the um, generous sums of money which Mr. Hammond is making available are there to scale up the, um, the customs activities on the frontier in case we need to do that. And then on the fish, uh, well, I assume when the Spaniards bought quota, uh, their lawyers would have reminded them that they were buying a quota issued by the European Union under the Euro European Union rules, and that were the UK to leave the European Union, then I presume they would realise that their quota had no value. Uh, because it is, a, it is an EU quota. But Britain being so decent and generous, I'm sure we sit down and discuss these things with them, and there are reciprocal rights the other way which we need to take into account. But the legal position, I think, must be pretty clear that if, if a country leaves an institution and then completely changes the system, uh, then those people have to sit down and negotiate with you uh, from the position where they bought something which no longer has the continuing value that they anticipated. I just say lots of questions. I'll say one small thing about um, fishing. Um, very few people under 50 remember um, how we were hoodwinked when we went into the European Economic Community in 1973 and how literally the day before the six original Treaty of Rome countries um, passed a, a resolution that suddenly our fishing grounds were acknowledging that Edward Heath was so determined to go in and for this to be his 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 um, his um, you know, his crown and glory that the fishermen were sold out and I keep reading that oh who cares about the fishermen it's less than one percent of GDP firstly it's the symbolic thing but also what we should realise, ladies and gentlemen, is some of the most deprived areas in the country are our former fishing villages, and particularly 20 miles, a zone 20 miles inland from those former fishing villages. If we can re-galvanise our fishing industry, it's great not just for the environment and those fishing villages themselves. You'll have prosperity uh, pushing in land in some of the most deprived parts of the country. And it's also good... For our tourist industry as well, young people will start to stay in those fishing villages. It's fantastic regional policy and it ties into one of the major upsides of Brexit we are not hearing about. You know, when you're free of the European Union, you can do things like free ports, you can do things like enterprise zones, you can use things like your own indirect tax system, VAT, to bring about outcomes by offering tax incentives to both domestic and foreign entrepreneurs to get things done. It's just ridiculous that a country as innovative and savvy commercially as the UK can't even use its own tax system in order to engender a good regional policy. Since we joined the European Union, for all that I love London, and you can hear in my voice I'm a Londoner, but it's our, our, our northern cities and Glasgow, these are world famous cities with huge brands in their own right. They can become large alternative growth centres for the U U United Kingdom doing a huge amount to solve our massive regional inequalities, our housing crisis, and to get back some real regional identity in this country that makes it what it is. What does the panel think about this uh, PESCO? this uh, European Defence Force, which we are going to be joining. Okay. Do you know anything about this, John? Well, my view is that uh, we will, from time to time, wish to cooperate with um, forces uh, on the continent. I think we should mainly do that through NATO, but they don't rule out doing it in other ways, but the only requirement must be that we remain in complete control and we decide whether we wish to do it or not. Because we've always taken the view that when it comes to 
uh, very difficult decisions about whether to use lethal force or to um, use our um, army and navy and air force uh, in potentially dangerous situations, that must be a decision for the British people and their elected representatives, and they must be answerable directly uh, in the normal way. Thank you. Yes, lady there. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. I'm um, Kathleen Mains. Um, to put the best light on the refusal by the government to take back control of our fishing in March 2019, I suspect it's because we just don't have enough fishery protection vessels. Um, now, the fishery protection vessels are terribly important not just for protecting our fleets, but for protecting our waters. And we've been having Russian incursions into the North Sea, down, down our Atlantic coast, and will, as part of our pressure to take back control, will you put pressure onto the um, Treasury to put more money into the Ministry of Defence to build up our protection? I, uh, we are the ones who are most vulnerable to Russian incursions. We are the ones who need to be patrolling the waters round us. We need as soon as possible to take back control of our seas, not just so that we can revitalize some of the poorest parts of the country, but so that we can defend ourselves. John, do you want to comment briefly on this? I, I don't think that was the, the main reason. They are ordering some new fishery protection vessels, and I think there are many who would like to see a bigger commitment to defence, and, and that would include uh, making sure we have adequate naval presence. There's also an issue about how quickly we can build up fishing capacity, because we envisage a much bigger fishery for uh, British based boats. But there's no, no time like the present, and the fishing industry needs to be given a clear lead on when the capacity is needed, and then I'm sure they will make the necessary arrangements, but they need to have confidence in the policy. But no, I think it was just part of the negotiation, and that's why I think we could withdraw that part of the offer unless something really exceptional is offered to us. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, John Strafford. Um, the government uh, has given a contract to a French, or primarily French company, to print the British passport. Um, and, and it has raised the issue of whether we are to be a protectionist country or a free trading co country. I have to say, I voted leave so that we could be a buccaneering, ocean-going, free trading nation uh, and take on the world because the world is our oyster and I don't want to see us go back and to the protectionism and hiding behind the walls. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you John. Uh, I, I think that's right. Um, my own view about this um, uh, is that Delarue thought that the British government would just give it to a British firm because they were scared of the Daily Mail or whatever, uh, and so they upped their price. And on a 490 million pound contract, they were 120 million pounds adrift, which is uh, that's 12 million pounds a year, it's 500 nurses. So it's not a betrayal. I disagree with some people on the Brexit side, and I think they're walking to a tra into a trap by arguing that it's a betrayal, frankly. Uh, it's plain common sense. And how ridiculous would we have looked had we um, imposed sort of French-style protectionism um, as we're trying to up our game and raise our sights to the rest of the world, we would have looked uh, ridiculous. So I think Theresa May, and particularly somebody who people in this room may not have appreciated in the past, Amber Rudd, made exactly the right decision in this case. And I think it speaks well of the UK that there was a blind tender uh, where the identity of the firms aren't uh, known to the civil servants and other decision makers. The outcome came out as it came, and yet they stuck to the rules. Now, if Delarue, Delarue the, the, the chief executive of Delarue says that 600 
people in Gateshead can lose their job. But when I check this out, only 100 of those 600 are actually working on passports, the rest are working on currency. And they're all currently working on other countries' passports. So, so they understand the, the, the principle. Uh, and I'm sure they can win that business um, with Britain now having the moral high ground. So I think the government made the right decision here. It was a difficult decision, and I think they should be congratulated for it. Thank you. What I think is absurd is people talking about good deal and bad deal. They just don't want a deal because they they never want a deal because they don't want us to leave. Yeah. Um, okay. What I'd like to ask John Redwood, if I may, is um, we all I'm sure we all agree with him. I followed him for years and admired his uh, stoicness and his, his wonderful intellect and so on. But do you think that, that with the arithmetic in the House of Commons at the moment? that if there was a lousy deal being proposed, that they would vote for a no deal, if they, if they have the opportunity. Talk about that at the moment, and not uh, wise to talk about that at the moment. And we, all, we all wish the government every success in getting a good deal, and we particularly wish the government every success in getting the EU withdrawal bill into an act of parliament as soon as possible, and I think we need to concentrate on that for the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Blumenthal. Firstly, may I say I was somewhat disappointed with John Redwood's response about PESCO, which we all know is the European Army. And if we become part of a European army, we're still part of a European state. But the question I wish to ask was to Liam Halligan, which is, we talked a lot of talk about the damage that can be done to trade caused by the situation in Ireland. My question is, what is the risk to the southern Irish era? The Taoiseach is so bullish about uh, threatening the UK. How much of the Irish trade comes to us or goes through us? I think that's that's exactly right. I think I think this isn't a mistake that Bertie Ahern would have made, or even Enda Kenny. Um, the current Taoiseach is relatively young um, and inexperienced, and I think he's been hoodwinked by the the European uh, Commission. And a lot of Irish people feel the same way. There's a lot of Irish people who want you know a, a cabinet minister in the Irish government for Brexit. But if the Irish government appoints a minister for Brexit, it means that they're negotiating mano a mano with the UK and not as part of the team EU. Irish people know well where their bread is buttered. And if we have commercial genius in this country, they are per head at least a match for us, I may say so, if I may say so. And it's not just that about 20% of Ireland's uh, exports go to the EU. Uh, it's not just that there are half a million um, people born in Ireland who currently live in the UK as well as countless you know, people like me of, of very obvious Irish origin. Um, it's also the fact that a very high proportion of Irish uh, goods exports cross the UK in lorries on their way to Rotterdam. So it really is a logistic nightmare if the Irish can't get a special deal with the UK. Look, we've traded between Britain and Ireland through thick and thin for several millennia. Um, free movement between our countries goes back to the Irish Free State in 1923. Even at the height of the Troubles, um, cousins of mine would come over in the 60s and 70s and would instantly be given the vote in our country, even though the countries were essentially at civil war. This relationship between Britain and Ireland is like no other in the world. We're so entwined and so linked by blood and, and, and affinity and love. Um, um, and the, the Irish know that their relationship to Britain commercially, psychologically, culturally is absolutely massive. Um, and that's why I'm, I think there's a growing scepticism in Ireland that they are overplaying their hand. You know, yeah. Irish people say to me, I care a lot more about our relationship with the UK than I do about our relationship with Latvia. And that's not to put down Latvia. Um, just imagine if Britain, get this, just imagine if Britain did do a free trade agreement with the United States, completely within the realms of possibility. You would then have two countries, right? 
Ireland is geographically in the middle of that free trade agreement, literally geographically. It is psychologically in the middle of that free trade agreement. Its sons and daughters you know, can claim to have built both countries, or at least mm. make massive contributions to both countries. Its sons and daughters live, breed, love, raise children in both countries. The trade that Ireland has, you know, the majority of Ireland's trade now, given it's going gangbusters in the emerging markets and in the States, as well as the base of its trade here, the majority of Irish trade is non-Euro denominated now. Ireland has become a net contributor to the European budget. The EU is getting increasingly heavy on the Irish about their tax rates and all this foreign direct investment that they get. There's a lot of envy in France and Holland. It has a tremendous pharmaceuticals industry. There's a lot of envy and all the rest of it. Imagine if Britain and the US did a free trade agreement and the Irish couldn't join. Just imagine. Just imagine. As happened here, I'm not saying I advocate Ireland join, exiting the European Union. It's psychologically, it's such a huge step. And they must make that step themselves. And when, yeah. when people of Irish origin from you know, nice, comfortable perches in the UK start advocating that, we rile them. And I totally understand why. I totally understand why. I'm not going to publicly advocate their exit. What I am going to say is, you think how quickly the debate changed in this country. Mm -hmm. And we are a massive you know, political superpower, if you like, in terms of our culture. Irish politics is a lot more mercurial, a lot more transactional, a lot more self-interested in some ways, a lot more pragmatic. I say to you, sir, if Britain and Ireland, uh, the US sign a free trade agreement, opinions in Ireland, when you've got the big contributions they're going to be making when we've left, mm -hmm. and the EU getting increasingly heavy on their tax independence, opinions in Ireland could change very quickly indeed. I would add one thing on, on the trade. We need to remember that there is a, a very important Republic of Ireland to United Kingdom trade, but it practically all goes across the Irish Sea. Very, very little crosses the Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland. Mm. Most, mostly local, isn't it? it? That's mainly little local things. Uh, the bulk of the trade, overwhelming majority, goes across the Irish Sea, so it already has a, uh, an interstate border. Um, and the, um, e, as it does in the North Coast, and the, the EU army point, maybe I wasn't clear enough. I have no wish for us to join an EU army. I thought that was what I said in, in polite language. I didn't campaign to get us out of the EU to join an EU army. It's just that I don't think you can rule out, if they go on and create an EU army, that we might sometimes do joint things with them. But that has to remain very much our choice and under our control, just as it does with all our other allies through NATO. And as I said at the time, I repeat again, I think NATO should be the main way that we cooperate with our country. Yeah. So, Edward Farmer, um, representing the UK Free Trade Zone Association. My question is, is the civil service fit for purpose to deliver clean Brexit? And secondly, if it's not fit for purpose, what will be done about it? I mean, being be no doubt, I think some of the, the, the world-admired institutions in the British Civil Service really acted in a way that undermined their integrity during the referendum in yeah. yeah. Particularly the Treasury, an institution you know, I was brought up to admire as an economics academic. Um, some of the reports they put out were based on assumptions that were frankly absurd. Um, it is the civil service that we've got though. It's, there's enough brain power and it's capable. What it needs is very, very firm political leadership. That this is what we're doing, this is what we require. And I think when, when, I, when, when you do have civil servants deliberately trying to sort of freelance and, and scupper um, the UK's negotiating position, as we've seen, and by God they get a lot of support by, from the broadcasters, don't they? Uh, oh, bloke from the Foreign Office wants to stay in the EU. Oh, is that news? <laughs> <laughs> of course they do. Then they need to be dealt with very, very firmly, because that's completely out of line. They're not a democratically elected people. If the democratically elected government, backed up by a, a referendum, wants to do something, the civil service 
has to do it. But we do need our civil servants. We do need to um, try and find a way to make the, the least uh, uh, the least enthusiastic get into line and tell them that they are there to serve the people rather than to use... And, and, you know, I think there should be rules. People are leaving the Foreign Office and going straight onto the airwaves and working for some massive pro-Remain organisations while drawing a civil service pension. I mean, it's... I, I find that very distasteful. John, just to comment on this one as well? No? Um, can, I, can I just raise a question on this matter as well? Um, do the powers think there is a lack of political control in our Brexit negotiations? Uh, I must admit that I was rather surprised with the arrangements that we have for negotiation, and that the negotiation seems to be very much in the hands of a civil servant, Holly Robbins. And the Brexit Secretary, uh, I've heard reports the Brexit Secretary hasn't been to Brussels for three months. Now, when we negotiated our membership of the EU on two occasions, whatever one thought, political control uh, was there, ministers were there on a daily basis negotiating. Uh, do the panelists think that our negotiation would be more effective if we had more visible and effective political control? Mm -hmm. Liam? Um, I'd start by saying that um, for all the, while I agree with the premise of your question, I think we should preface it with, 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 with the following. Um, we know that there are big differences of opinion within the cabinet, but if only because of the fear of Jeremy Corbyn winning, it is actually, when you think about how politics can be, it is actually not bad that the, the cabinet has managed for the most part, for most of the time, to have a single message. Now, the kind of stop Brexit crowd will deride that, but for the most part, you know, Amber Rudd and Liam Fox are, are largely singing from the same hymn sheet. You haven't got people within the government briefing, oh, if only we could stay in the single market. You had a little bit of that at the beginning, and you had a little bit of that even after Lancaster House. But Lancaster House, followed up by Florence, followed up by the Mansion House, and the Prime Minister, whatever you think of her, has shown a lot of determination. I wish she'd tell Ian Dale that she'd just vote for Brexit. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I, I don't actually think that's true. I don't, I'm sure there's lots of concern in this room, and she has conceded on some issues. I agree. I agree. But on the main menu items, we're going to be outside the single market, we're going to be outside the customs union. She has been remarkably firm. She's been remarkably firm. And she's managed somehow to hold a cabinet together full of extremely ambitious people, as they always are, who can see that flux is coming. Do we, I've, I think I've said enough, I've, mm. I've upset enough civil servants in the audience already tonight on the other question. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Yes, gentleman there. Please. I'm just taking a question for the gentleman here and then we'll... Oh, you've got the microphone already. Yeah, you, 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 you have your question. I thought the Alright, carry on. I thought was there any other time. Say there any other time. Carry on. Um, look, we've all talked about no deal and the negotiation and all the rest of it. Just when is the final whistle to be blown on negotiations and we say, sorry, you clearly are just stringing it along. We won't agree anything by May, uh, March next year. We won't have agreed anything by December 2020. Just when do we say, clearly you're not negotiating, everything's to string us along and to get nowhere. When, when do we blow that whistle? John. What we will blow that whistle if and when the Prime Minister judges that is the right thing to do. The, the indicative timetable at the moment uh, from both sides it is that they wish to have quite intensive talks between now and September, October. And then in the Autumn Council to try and put together a complete package where they will then hope that the United Kingdom will sign the withdrawal agreement. And that is the very important point where many of us will be saying, do not sign a withdrawal agreement unless and until there is a really good total package which makes the sacrifices of the withdrawal agreement worthwhile. And that is where we need to get back into the argument I was taking you through in my opening remarks about how high a hurdle is no deal and could deal 
actually be better. But the current indication is that is in the autumn. But it will be when either the Prime Minister decides it is from the United Kingdom side or when the European Commission and their member states decide it is from their side. And, and to just wrap up the, uh, the last set of exchanges, uh, it is very clearly the case that Mr. Oddy Robin as Chief Official Negotiator and Mr. Jeremy Hayward, the Cabinet Secretary, have considerable influence and are spending an enormous amount of their time on this particular set of negotiations. Uh, but they can only do so all the time they please the Prime Minister. The person who is actually in charge of these negotiations is the Prime Minister. Uh, and if she chooses to use their skills and advice, more than perhaps you would like, that is her choice. And our system is that it is the politician <coughs> who has to sell the deal and take responsibility for it, whoever may have done all the detailed work. Thank you. Yes, come up to you, sir. Robin Willow. Um, um, as I said to um, right on Lord Kate Hoey, unfortunately, um, I have compelling evidence of civil servants being dishonest and indeed lying with the full support of the senior management. Um, this is very regrettable, but it's, it's the reality. Um, concerning PESCO, if I may, um, it, well, it has been reported that the Prime Minister is intending to sign up to PESCO, and this is what has been worrying uh, people, um, because if, if that happens, that will be will appear very dangerous and a, a security issue, rather like the passports matter, is a security issue. Um, so can you please, for the last time, confirm that she isn't going to sign up to PESCO, please? No, I can't confirm that. I've stated my view that we should not, in any circumstance, join a European army or get to the position where we were committed to other people's rules and instructions. I assume that is going to be the government's view on all this, but we will only know if and when a text emerges, when I'm sure I will give you a critique of it as soon as I've read it. And on passports, the contract actually stipulates that the chip is made in the UK. The security side. The, it's the booklet that's going to be made overseas, and it actually, under pressure, uh, there's increasing signs that Gamato is actually going to make it under license in the UK anyway. Um, so we'll see. Just one small thing. One one thing. Either either Delarue could improve its offer without the kind of assumption that they're going to get the contract anyway, or in order to encourage competition, um, have both of them produce the thing. Uh, and then award the final contract in five years' time. We need some competition in our, yeah. among our public yeah. procurement. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. The House of Lords is, it would appear, seems to be packed full with people who are sympathetic to remain. This could present the government with enormous problems. Is there any will on the government's part to increase the number of peers in the House of Lords with peers who are favourable towards Brexit? You heard anything on the journalistic break? Well, clearly not, because uh, if you were going to do that, you'd have done it by now, because at any point we might face votes in the House of Lords. We'll certainly be facing votes in the House of Lords immediately after Easter. Um, it was not clear that the Lords would stick to their normal rule and, and have no votes uh, during the detailed committee stage, but they have stuck to that rule, and so, so far there have been no challenging votes in the Lords in the committee stages. But when they get to report, then it is very likely that there will be several issues selected by their lordships with this large Remain majority. They may, may wish to rerun the customs union, which we twice settled in the House of Commons. Uh, they may wish to rerun ministerial powers. They may wish to rerun uh, the role of the devolved assemblies. There are a number of things that they can pick up, which would be unhelpful from the Brexit and government point of view. Uh, and then we will see what happens, uh, assuming that they, they pass a few 
uh, disagreeable amendments from the government's point of view. They will come back to the Commons. Uh, we assume our majority remains intact because we won everything by one vote uh, the first time around on the EU withdrawal bill. And then you would have thought their lordships might say uh, double dem democratic endorsement of this. We had a countrywide referendum and a 2017 general election when both main parties in those days were elected on a pro-Brexit ticket. Uh, what more kind of democratic endorsement do you do? So you would hope their lordships might then decide they've, they've asked the Commons to revise, we don't want to revise, and that's the end of it. That's the happy scenario. Uh, if it gets more lively than that, then I'm sure people other than me will be raising constitutional issues uh, because it would clearly not be sensible for an unelected revising chamber uh, to decide to try and fundamentally undermine the settled decision of the British people in both a referendum and a general election. John, John's completely right, of course, but there are I mean, the, the Lords is packed with pro-Remain people in all parties, not, not just the Lib Dems, but the, the Tories and Labour as well, and a lot of crossbenchers, a lot of people in the, peer, in the Lords, they've made a lot of their career in, in Europe, and they see it as an ideal being of, of, of a certain age, if you like. I mean, Richard Newby, the leader of the Lib Dems in the Lords, has said that, you know, he doesn't care if the Lords is abolished as a result of this, as long as he stops Brexit. There's, in, in our book, Jerry and I, in the penultimate chapter, we, we, we talk about how the Lords could try and justify scuppering this in their own mind. And very, very briefly, a lot of the reason why Theresa May called an election wasn't only just to get her own mandate, but was so she could be elected on a manifesto that included, we're going to leave the single market and we're going to leave the customs union. Having been elected on that with a majority, the Salisbury Addison um, Convention, um, which is a post-war Labour Conservative agreement, um, uh, means that the uh, unelected upper house can't try and it can it can amend but it can't overturn uh, election manifesto pledges right so she thought she would be safe that's a major reason why she did an election so Salisbury Addison uh, would apply um, this sounds nerdy but actually it's very very important if you bear with me but of course she didn't get a majority and no one really knows if Salisbury Addison applies under a confidence and supply agreement because there's not really much precedent. What I know, and I outline in my book, is that if you read the DUP manifesto, mm. right, it's a bit vague. Uh, it's a bit vague. Even though the DUP themselves are, of course, ardently pro-Brexit, it talks about things, wanting to do things that you can only do if you're outside of the single market and the customs union, but it doesn't have bullet point, we want to leave the single market, bullet point, we will going to leave the customs union, and then you could argue that um, the combined majority wants to leave the single market and the customs union. And after the 2010 coalition deal, the Hansard Society did a whole study on whether or not Salisbury Addison should apply under a coalition, because again, we had no real, we had a sort of bit of lib, lib lab pact that fell to pieces. We, we had no sustained example since the Second World War when Salisbury Addison was created. It was created so a, a conservative dominated laws didn't stop Labour's nationalisation because it was clearly what the country wanted after the Second World War. So we are really un entering uncharted constitutional territory in this country. And it could well be that, that, legal, that lawyers in the upper house, massively pro-Remain lawyers in the upper house, use this wrinkle in the DUP manifesto to try and justify say, the, saying that there is no democratic, you know, Salisbury Addison need not apply. You heard it here first. Um, some of the parliamentary tricks that have been um, uh, pulled already by the Lords, they've remained under the radar and only nerds have followed them. Uh, but this could well spring into the mainstream if they do actually try and block this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, our, our speakers have been very generous with their time. I'm, I'm just going to take one more question. Yes, I'm, young man on the front there. Um, I won't use the mic, but here's the mic. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first, first point to make, I, I would be delighted if uh, the Prime Minister would be rather more firm with the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Humphrey Appleby. Sorry, I mean Sir Jeremy Hayward. Um, <laughs> hopefully you all got that reference to uh, the Yes Minister. Um, every time I come home 
every evening from work for my commute back. I bought the tube, which is absolutely packed. Today was even more packed because of the DLR industrial action. And I've given a free copy of uh, the former Chancellor's propaganda, which is the Evening Standard. Um, and every single day, it does not fail to have some Brexit geddon hysterical conspiracy theory about how the whole of the world, of all the UK, is going to completely fall apart uh, with Brexit and how damaging it is to every single to every single day. There's either a front page or second page. What, what can we do about this? This has the question. What can we do to counteract this kind of a level of propaganda, essentially? Thank you. Uh, well, what we have to do is what I'm doing and you're doing tonight. We have to show that we really mean this and remake the argument. They're making us fight the referendum again. Well, we did it very well the first time round. But we've got to make sure that our argument doesn't go by default and we present it. And it does seem to me that we're actually winning. I think we now have more support today than we did on referendum day. And there are, there are many decent remainders. many decent Remain voters who now say, well, I, I was a bit marginal, I voted Remain because I really believed all those economic fears, I now see all those economic fears are untrue, so I'm with you. There are other decent Remain voters who say, well, I was a bit marginal, uh, but this is the will of the people, so now I accept the will of the people, and we're going to get on with it. So I think we need to constantly encourage and uh, welcome in, we don't want to be aggressive and, and in no way should you be extreme. We are the mainstream. We should be proud of what we're trying to do, and we need to bring more people with us. And the more people that come with us, the more that even the editor of the Evening Standard will come to see that he has to offer something to the other side of the argument, because there are great swathes of London where there are a very large number of lead voters who, who don't like what he's saying. And if we can get that up to 50%, and um, maybe those who own the Evening Standard will say, is this a wise commercial judgment? <laughs> uh, but given his views, I think I'd rather he was the, uh, in the Evening Standard than Chancellor the Exchequer. <laughs> The simple calculation in, in George Osborne's mind is if is that is this: if Brexit is a success, he is absolutely finished politically. Yes. And if Brexit fails, he could come back as the prince across the water. And that reality, I'm sure, informs a lot of his decision making as editor, as well as some the sort of personal uh, venom that is pretty much inevitable if you've lived. Uh, a life has he has as we must acknowledge at the very top of British politics and I don't I don't know George Osborne particularly well um, I think what he's doing with the standard is ridiculous uh, I think his and I often knock him in my column uh, on the other hand uh, I do think we were lucky that he was around uh, have, he went from let's share the proceeds of growth to oh my god we're going to have another IMF crisis. We, I mean that took quite a lot of guts, and I would I would tip my hat to him for that. And all I'd say about the standard is what we need to do is we need we need if there's any um, uh, moneyed entrepreneurs in the room uh, we need another London paper and we need me to edit it. this evening is that uh, the night I really knew we were going to win the referendum uh, was the night that I got um, a phone call from Vote Leave and they gave me their idea of what Mr Osborne was going to say the, the next day in what we decided to call the punishment budget and they gave me this readout and they said what did I think and I roared with laughter and they said no no this is serious I said no it's not serious at all this is this is the most absurd thing I've ever had heard I think it will give us the referendum it is so over the top it is so silly and I then explained to Ben Lee that I for example as a Conservative MP wouldn't dream of voting for a punishment budget if we just decided to leave the EU I'd be looking for an optimistic and exciting budget full of opportunity and I'm sure I had some friends who would take the same view, so I wasn't quite sure how the Chancellor's Exchequer thought he might get such a fun 
uh, punishment budget through. And I left it with them and had a good night's sleep. And, and I woke up the next morning, um, turned on the Today programme, expecting to hear Mr. Osborne uh, feeling very pleased with himself. And instead, the news story was 60 Tory rebels say Chancellor not a prayer of getting through punishment budget. <laughs> And I think that, ladies and gentlemen, was a very important event in the referendum campaign because at last we were able to show that we thought these forecasts were completely absurd and the consequences of them couldn't conceivably happen. But they're not stopping, are they? I mean, Project Fear rumbles on. And the last word from me, apart from thank you to all of you, um, uh, and thank you to John for allowing me to share the platform with him, um, the last thing I'd say is that just remind your friends and yourselves that the process of leaving is temporary, but the benefits of being uh, an independent trading nation once more are permanent. And urge your MPs, um, urge the Prime Minister um, to talk up the benefits yeah. of Brexit. Let's not just focus on the headbanging process. This is not a cross the Prime Minister must bear. This is an opportunity to oversee some of the most sweeping changes that Britain's ever seen. Changes that aren't backward looking, they're not anachronistic, they are absolutely pertinent to the history of our times. The, the whole global economy is shifting away from Europe. We needn't be scared of this. We needn't be scared of this. We are uniquely qualified in Europe with the English language, with our competitive outlook, with our outgoing people, with pockets of expert Brits all over the world. They've been there for generations. They desperately want to reconnect with us, as well as the Five Eyes security relationship. We have the greatest security and intelligence network the world has ever known, which we are absolutely in the middle of, the node of. So let's be confident. Let's urge our parliamentarians to get beyond the process and start talking about the future. Yeah. Well, that, so, ladies and gentlemen, is a wonderful note to end on. Uh, that positive agenda, the vision of us outside the European Union, with Liam as editor of a successful newspaper. <laughs> And John Redwood playing a proper role in the House of Commons as Chancellor of Sheffield. You're right, sir. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, this evening has been a privilege. Uh, we've had knowledge, passion and clarity from our speakers. And we, we've all been so lucky to be here tonight and have such direct and coherent answers to our questions. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please once again show your appreciation for our speakers.